Hi folks, welcome. Um, stop sharing. Welcome to Astronomy on Tap, uh, our April 2021 event uh, in collaboration with the MSU Science Festival. Hopefully you're all able to hear and see us. I'm gonna ask my presenters to awaken if they haven't walked away from their computers. Perfect, they actually exist. That would be terrifying for them to just leave while I'm ready to give a two hour long event. Uh, okay, well, welcome back to Astronomy on Tap. Uh, it's great to not see all of you, but to talk to a screen for a bit with my camera, okay. Um, so I'm excited to get to hang out uh, with all of you virtually. Uh, I just want to say if you ever at any point during our event, you have questions, comments that you want to put into the chat, you can do that in the Facebook live stream chat. Um, there'll also be a mechanism, those of you that are not Facebook users, to uh, text in um, questions that you may have about the event as well. We'll get to all to that in a moment. Uh, what I'd like to do first is give those of us that are here, uh, we have a mix of presenters and AOT organizers, some of which are both. Um, and so we'll just go around really quickly on my screen and give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves where they're located, uh, since we do have some folks from outside the Lansing area today, um, and then we'll get started. So I'm just going to go around in the order that's on my screen, and we're going to start with Addie. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Addie Dove. I'm at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida. Perfect. Thanks, Addie. Uh, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Frisbee. I am your trivia manager. I'm a postdoc at MSU working with Devin. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Austin? Hi, uh, I'm Austin Edmister. I am the planetarium operator at Ella Sharp Museum in Jackson, Michigan, just about half an hour south of Lansing. Uh, happy to be back. Perfect. Thanks, Austin. And Chelsea? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to regulars. Uh, you know me, Chelsea Harris, postdoc here at MSU, uh, computational astrophysicist. Awesome. Great. So what we're going to do now is we'll dive into, as those of you that have been here before, we'll go through sort of an overview of what you can expect this evening before we dive into our first talk. Um, so let's see. As always, I'm going to take a moment to share with you the content I have planned. Uh, let's give it a shot here. All right. And okay. So, what do you have in store for tonight? Uh, we're going to have two talks in our patented new astronomy news segment. So, keep an eye out for that. Screen sharing is paused. That seems worrisome. Screen sharing is live again. Perfect. Uh, okay. So, uh, our first talk of the evening will be from Austin. He's a planetarium operator at the Ella Sharp Museum down in Jackson. He'll be talking, he'll be giving you a virtual planetarium type show uh, about the Mars Perseverance rover and things that are happening with robots on Mars. So look forward to that. Then we have uh, Dr. Addie Dove, a uh, professor in physics at the University of Central Florida. And Addie is actually a former grad school classmate of mine. She was in the class ahead of me. So trying to figure out the other day, I think I've known Addie since roughly 2007, which is pretty wild and I can't believe it's 2021, uh, but that's sort of exciting and both, um, you know, maybe depressing, hard to say, uh, but she's going to talk about the experiments she does in microgravity uh, to help understand um, some things uh, that you'll find out about tonight. Her specialty is planetary science, so that's what we'll get to hear coming up. Then we'll get tapped in with Dr. Chelsea Harris. We'll get some uh, recent astronomy news, things that are happening out there in the astronomy world and potentially some local astronomy highlights. At the end of the evening, we'll have the opportunity. We'll open the floor. If you have any general physics or astronomy questions you want to throw at us, we'll do our best to answer them. And we reserve every right to ignore questions that we simply do not want to answer. OK, so uh, that's where we're headed. I do want to point out You'll have the opportunity uh, throughout the event to put questions into the chat. Um, you can drop that right in the Facebook uh, live stream chat, or if you are not Facebook inclined and you're just watching as a member of the uh, non-Facebook community, watching as a, a general public live stream, you can text to that number. So take a screenshot, take a picture with your phone, jot it down real quick. You can text to that number and we'll be monitoring those as well, should you have questions that you wanna ask. Um, of our presenters and at the general uh, Q&A at the end of the night. Okay, so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. The more questions we get, the more fun it is for us. Otherwise, we're just uh, five people sitting on Zoom at seven o'clock at night. So uh, please send in some questions. 
our next event. Uh, if you're looking forward, you're already having a blast and grand old time, May 12th, 2021. Uh, that's when our next event will be. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we don't know yet what will be what it'll be about, and hopefully we'll actually have presenters lined up because I've done zero organizing up to this point. So that's a very quick rundown of everything that's going to happen this evening. Uh, we will be, oh, I did also want to point out, uh, since I didn't directly address it, this is part of the larger MSU Science Festival happening for the month of April. So I did put that in the upper corner. Uh, it happens all the way through the end of April. If you go to MSU Science Festival or sciencefestival.msu.edu, Google MSU Science Festival, you'll get there, I promise. Um, you can look at all the different events. There are other evening events happening, live stream events, Zoom webinars, um, various things happening uh, throughout the state, throughout the month, uh, all virtual, all free. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. And it's good uh, opportunities for all ages, uh, all sorts of different science events. So I encourage you to, to check that out as well. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna let Austin take over. Thanks, Devin. I'm excited to be back. And I'm gonna be talking about the robots on Mars. So I'm going to make sure my stuff is good to go. There it is. And I'm going to share my screen. You should see above uh, Earth, actually, right below Robots on Mars. Um, I kind of start this on Earth because that's where all these robots come from. Um, and we'll kind of blast out through the solar system and see things from a far away distance. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the Earth. You've seen the Earth on Google Maps probably a hundred times or more. Uh, we see it from space all the time. It's something we take for granted. Uh, but it is important to know that we started from the ground on Earth. We live down here. We live our daily lives. Uh, you know, a lot of science in the past has happened on the Earth or in the air over time, and we've expanded into space, and now we can see Earth from space. We can dive down and see Michigan from space. We're getting a little bit close to sunset there, but there's our wonderful Mitten State with the Great Lakes around it. Uh, and it's sort of the reverse for Mars, right? Mars is far away, and so we see it from space, and then we go to the ground in various ways. And all of these different robots that people have sent are working together to complete this mission. Uh, there's a lot of different objectives for these missions. Uh, sometimes it's nice just to understand another planet, right? There's all kinds of really cool things we can learn about the universe by visiting other planets in the solar system. And in our solar system, we have plenty to choose from. So now we're kind of flying above the solar system. We're uh, a few billion miles away from the sun. I'd say a few, probably a one and a half or a couple. There's our planetary orbits. And I've highlighted Mars in red. Uh, and here we have the solar system as it is right now. As you can see Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. You can see about where we are uh, in the solar system. And generally the circles are about our orbits. They're a little bit bigger than our orbit paths, of course. And the point, their direction they're going is where there's empty space. But I can kind of give you a good sense of that by changing the way time moves. So I'm going to reverse time in days per second. So we're going to go back pretty quickly. And we're going back into January, and then December, and November, and October. And you can get a sense, oh, we were just by Mars. So the Earth and Mars do get really close together, uh, tens of millions of miles apart, as opposed to a couple hundred million miles apart. And obviously, if you want to go to Mars, that's the best time to do it. So right about here, uh, near the beginning of August, we're a little in middle August now, but near the beginning of August for 2020 was a great time to go to Mars. Earth is approaching Mars around its orbit, moving at twice the speed of Mars, and soon it will pass Mars. Uh, and we aimed a rocket at where Mars would be on February 18th, 2021, give or take uh, a few days probably. So we speed up time, we see Earth pass, the rover has already launched aboard a rocket. Uh, and then by the time that the rover arrives on the rocket in February, so now we're here in the middle of February, Earth is already tens of millions of miles further away from Mars. And it's going to take a while for us to come back around. So we speed up time again, a little bit faster this time. 
and we go into the middle of 2021, the fall, the winter, and then we can start coming into 2022. Now we're in the summer of 2022, and right about in the late fall of 2022 in October is when another window comes for us to go to Mars, right? You wanna go when Mars is close, you don't wanna go when it's super duper far away. Uh, and that's why you hear about Mars in the news a bunch every two years, because it takes a little over two years or 26 months for us to catch back up with Mars on the same side of the sun. And that also makes it an obstacle when we send things to Mars, especially if we start thinking about sending people. Because if we send someone to Mars, they're going to have to stay on the planet for at least a year, and they're going to be traveling in space for around a year. And there's just going to be a lot of in between. They can't go to the Mars, they can't go to Mars and back to Earth just like we can on the moon in a few days. It's a long term project. And so, of course, sending robots to Mars that don't have to come back uh, is a very optimal solution for that. I'm going to bring us back to the solar system today, rewind, and we can finally go visit Mars up close. Here we are up close with Mars. Like we just saw Earth a little while ago, this is the view of Mars from space. But that was kind of our first view, right? We see it from Earth as a tiny little reddish star that moves really quickly across the sky. Uh, and then finally, as our telescopes got bigger and bigger, we saw more and more of it. A lot of people had some pretty wild ideas about what they saw on the surface of Mars with telescopes on Earth. Uh, that kind of changed, of course, as we got a little more critical about it. Um, we don't you know, necessarily think there's a giant in, uh, alien civilization cr crisscrossing over the surface of Mars uh, desperate for water, you know, which what kind of inspired sci-fi stories like War of the Worlds among, you know, more earthly complicated things. And so this is our view we start with. And this view comes from spacecraft. Now this specific view is the Viking view. So the Viking landers that went to Mars in the 1970s went aboard orbiters. And these orbiters helped take these pictures that we see in front of us. But there are still orbiters around Mars right now. All kinds of different orbiters with different acronyms that start with M. Um, and all of these different orbiters have a lot of different missions. Some of them are designed to take pictures of the surface of Mars as it changes seasonally. Some of them are designed to see the poles of Mars. You can see them, they have a very nice polar orbit around the planet. Uh, and some of them are just really good at taking pictures. And they all do a multitude of things, but they're very helpful for getting a eye in the sky view of this planet that can be, you know, tens of millions of miles away to almost 300 million miles away. Now, of course, beyond the orbiters, we eventually did land robots on Mars, or I shouldn't say eventually, simultaneously. And these landers and eventually rovers have helped us build not just an above view of Mars, but an on the ground view, even though it is, you know, it's limited, but growing quickly. <clears throat> One of my favorite things from these orbiters uh, as I mentioned before, was the changing of Mars on its surface seasonally. Now, I, I'm not sure what's the state of these today. I believe it has been contended about whether or not these gullies are actually re the result of water flowing beneath Mars. But it is interesting to see these surface features on Mars because they're very reminiscent of the surface features on Earth. You see gullies like this on the sides of hills all over Earth. And you know, it's not necessarily a direct comparison, but when we zoom down to Mars, and I speed up time and I let Mars sort of drift beneath us, we see all kinds of things that we see here on Earth, craters, valleys, all kinds of interesting geographical, or I always forget the Mars appropriate word, aerographical, uh, something like that. But it's a pretty beautiful place and it's a dynamic place that uh, scientists think offer a lot of opportunities to learn about the Martian history of water, of having air, uh, and possibly a history of having life. This is one of my favorite regions of Mars with these massive dormant volcanoes. Uh, the top one, Olympus Mons, is huge, more than twice the height of Mount Everest. And it's so wide, if you were standing on it, you wouldn't even realize you might be on a mountain. 
Uh, right below these is Vallis marinaris, not something you put on your spaghetti sauce, but something wonderful to look at. Uh, this huge rift in the surface of Mars that has a complicated history because rifts on Earth form from oceanic crust and the crust of Earth spreading because of tectonic plates and you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. So you know, we see things like this and it makes us curious, you know, did Mars have a history of tectonic plates? I don't think so, but it's interesting to see these features and it raises a bunch of questions about what's actually going on on the surface of Mars and what's going on on the inside of Mars. Uh, so now we can start to meet some of the rovers. Um, of course, there's the Viking rovers, very simple pictures, lots of pictures, but I love their pictures of their surroundings of these huge robots, landers that kind of looked around and had uh, one of our very early on the surface views of Mars. Uh, some robots did land on Mars around that time and maybe before, but they were Russian robots and Russian Mars robots were not super great at landing back then. Uh, we can see some of the surroundings of Vi uh, Viking 2. This might be Viking 1. And it's a very rocky, dry looking place, which you can kind of get a sense of from space. But it also kind of makes you imagine a sort of very uh, deserty, arid climate, which, you know, kind of with, you know, the amount of water vapor in the air, there's none, essentially. Um, but it's a lot colder. So Mars can have a temperature range of a nice day on Earth, about 60 degrees. Um, and it can have a really cold day uh, of, you know, at least negative 130 degrees and colder sometimes, I think. A pretty wild place. These landers, as well as the orbiters that flew above Mars, figured out pretty quickly uh, that Mars doesn't have atmosphere like we do. Uh, it has, I think, 5% of the amount of stuff in its atmosphere as Earth does, and almost all of this is carbon dioxide. So kind of a different place, not something you want to imagine yourself going to and taking a big breath of air. But we have sent lots of landers to the surface to study it anyway, because who knows what we might find. Uh, we've sent the InSight and Phoenix landers, two of my favorite ones. They're really simple spacecraft. Uh, the Phoenix lander looks a lot like the InSight lander. They have these big circular solar panels uh, and their missions are just a couple of years of being on the surface of Mars and studying places or beneath Mars that we've never been able to see before. The Phoenix lander, I believe, went towards one of the poles, I want to say the North Pole of Mars, and kind of helped us study some of the environmental changes in a northern hemisphere latitude of Mars, because Mars does have a very dynamic and changing polar ice cap. That polar ice cap is made of dry ice or carbon dioxide ice, but scientists have also peered beneath this ice with radar and seen massive frozen lakes of water. So even more incentive to figure out what's going on with Mars. A couple of the most famous rovers were Spirit and Opportunity, of course. Uh, this 3D model kind of gives you a sense of uh, what those rovers were doing a lot of on the surface of Mars. Uh, they were exploring the surface with wheels going further than we'd ever gone before on another planet. And it was a really good geologist. It liked to drive around and drill in these rocks and figure out what the rocks were made of and help build an idea of what the surface of Mars has uh, chemically in those rocks. One of my favorite rovers, the Opportunity rover, another solar panel little beast. Uh, taking a selfie. Uh, these selfies were always kind of fun to see, but they were very important because it helped them understand the environment of the robot and also to check the robot itself, uh, as well as uh, make sure there weren't any aliens up on the surface tinkering around with it. But yeah, it's a bit of a leap. <laughs> and then on the surface was one of our most famous rovers for a lot of our generation, the Curiosity rover. Uh, this is a pretty tall rover. I think it's over two meters tall or close to two meters tall, um, dwarfs me. And it is it is a whole science laboratory. This is one pretty impressive machine uh, powered by plutonium-238, uh, radioactively heating that large uh, MTG battery in the back. And it's got all kinds of science experiments built throughout this whole rover, helping Curiosity 
not just understand the rocks of Mars, but the weather of Mars, the chemical composition of Mars. Um, it's a whole science lab that's doing geology, chemistry, and a little bit of biology, you know, you know protobiology for a place like Mars, but a very powerful robot. Um, and I'm just so glad it's still working. It helps to have a nuclear reactor or just a nuclear power source on your back uh, to get you through those dust storms. But really wonderful rover, and I hope it gets a lot more uh, juice out of this in uh, the coming years. Now, of course, Curiosity uh, is pretty successful, and NASA is also really good at taking something that works and improving upon it, saving you know a lot of money, and taking things even further than they ever have before. Uh, so that's where we get something like the Perseverance rover. Now, the Perseverance rover is landing on a place called Jezero Crater. Um, I haven't said it before, but they pick these places uh, based on information they have from those space orbiters above. They see interesting places that might have a history of water, such as Curiosity being in Gale Crater, which they think was a lake. Um, and I think they've got pretty good established uh, geological evidence to say yes to that. Uh, Perseverance is designed to do a similar thing, go to an interesting place on the surface of Mars that reminds us of some of the conditions on Earth where you find life. The place they picked is Jezero Crater. This wonderful crater, which we're seeing the side of, has a delta in it, uh, just like, well, not just like, but like the deltas we have here on Earth. You follow the Mississippi River all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, you get a wonderful delta down there in Louisiana. And deltas are packed with biological diversity. And so the hope is if we look at places on Mars that remind us of where we find life on Earth, we can follow suit and find ancient life on Mars. Now this Perseverance rover, again, was modeled after Curiosity. Uh, we have this picture of Perseverance in the testing lab about a year and a half ago. You can see how big it is compared to those scientists. I mean, they're off the distance just a bit, but this thing is also a wonderful machine and it's got a lot of character to it because uh, it's ready to explore Mars in ways we haven't really tried to before. I always like to imagine the rovers and see pictures of the rovers on their rockets. This is Perseverance being loaded into an Atlas V rocket nose cone just before its launch. Uh, and then on July 30th, uh, this rocket launched into space, headed for Mars. Uh, huge success, lots of pretty pictures from that. I always like rocket pictures too, so I thought I'd include one of those. It successfully did land in Jezero Crater, uh, and in a great place that gives them the opportunity to drive through the delta, exploring all kinds of different sites that they think may suggest um, good opportunity for life. I'm saying lots of maybes here, right? You can take a drink for every time I say maybe or might, but uh, you know, better look at where the sun shines and you might find flowers. Uh, of course, lots of wonderful pictures from Perseverance. This is the first uh, picture from the front camera of Percy or Perseverance. I love these pictures. They're very simple. They're usually very dusty and you don't see a lot but it's a successful picture. It's our first picture from a robot. And this is Percy's first picture. Uh, Perseverance, of course, has been looking around uh, quite a bit. Whoops, there's my picture. <clears throat> and this is one of the recent uh, pictures of its surroundings in the Delta. Uh, again, looks very rocky and Mars-like, of course, but uh, lots of little extra features in this area that we've never had a good chance to look for because NASA has been getting better and better at landing robots in places whoops, that are harder to get. So sorry for this weird view. I need to grab this picture and bring it down here because this is one of my favorites. You can tell this used to be a planetarium show. And this view of the Delta kind of points, I believe, right in the general direction that they wanna take Perseverance. And you can see there's a lot more geographical features there. It's not like the Viking landers with a big flat field of rocks. You get stuff and this stuff uh, kind of gives you more to work with when you were exploring a planet. 
Uh, Perseverance has already been checking out the rocks near it, uh, such as the Maaz rock. I love these zoomed in views of tiny little pebbles. Uh, this is kind of how Perseverance is going to pick its targets for uh, surface investigation. It's going to use its many experiments to analyze these little rocks uh, and look for interesting chemical features that might uh, be organic compounds or, you know, on the way off chance that they might find a tiny little microbe. I believe I have another one called Yego. Oh, too far out of view. I swear I fixed these right before the show. Another view of a nearby little rock with a lot of potential. Um, so <clears throat> I like seeing these. I hope you like seeing these too. Uh, maybe you're the kind of person that likes to uh, look for rocks out on our planet and investigate them and learn about the planet. And that is what Perseverance is going to do a lot of. So you'll be at home. Um, one of Perseverance's big missions is to uh, kind of help us find alien life. And one of the big ways it's going to do that is it's going to dig up little bits of Mars and put them in containers. You can see Perseverance's arm just a going right here. And it's going to take those little deposits of Mars, put them in safe containers, and leave them along as it goes. A future robot in the next few years will go to Mars, pick these up, and return to Earth so that scientists can hold Mars in their hand. Uh, also, uh, Perseverance is bringing a little friend along, this Ingenuity robot, a little helicopter, uh, our first attempt at powered flight on Mars. I'm pretty excited to see this thing fly. Uh, they sort of popped off the protective capsule for this uh, about a week and a half ago. And you can see Ingenuity hanging off the bottom of Perseverance. And right now it is fully leg extended, ready to start flying on Mars in a couple of days. I won't say too much. I think you might hear a little bit more about uh, how to view that in a little while, but really cool. Our first ever powered flight on Mars. And uh, I'm ready for that one to give it a go. I kind of imagine in the future, maybe we don't send a bunch of driving robots. We send little armies of uh, flying helicopters. Uh, and then finally, what Perseverance is doing a little bit of, and what all the robots have been doing a little bit of, besides finding alien life, is finding a potential for Earth life to go to Mars. You hear that all the time about sending people to Mars. When are we going to do it? When do we have the technology? We have the technology now. We can send you to Mars soon on a rocket. You'll die because you don't have all the supplies necessary to survive. Radiation will eat you away. And when you're on the surface of Mars, you have a huge list of things that are ready to kill you really quickly. So. Things like Perseverance and Curiosity and Spirit and Opportunity and all the robots that came before us um, are a little bit of a precursor to us. Me personally, I love what the robots are doing because if the robots find alien life on Mars, I think that gives us a heads up to be very careful if we go there, if we send people to Mars. We don't wanna send someone to Mars and have them bring coronavirus and give it to <laughs> one little bit of life left on this harsh planet. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it is exciting to think about the prospect of sending people to another planet. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was a little bit informative, informative and caught you up on some of the Mars stuff. Uh, thanks for listening. Sorry, I think I talked a bit over, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Austin. That was great. Uh, very cool to see some of that planetarium software running here in Zoom. Uh, hopefully, one of these days, we'll actually get to be back inside a real planetarium. Fingers crossed. Hey, uh, can I plug something real quick? Absolutely. We are doing um, limited private shows. We've, you know, we have re high reduced numbers in the theater, um, so it's safer in there. Um, and we do limited private shows. We offer private shows for like a small family. So even if you're not comfortable coming with like a larger group of people. Uh, you know, more than 10, um, you can bring just your family or household to a private planetarium show. And uh, we also do private telescope tours, all kinds of stuff like that. So that's very cool. Awesome. So they just need to, if folks want to do that, they just reach out to the Ella Sharp Museum directly about scheduling that. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Ellisharpmuseum.org or Ellisharp Museum on Facebook should guide you to all the opportunities. Uh, cool. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. So I think what we're going to do now is we had a few questions come in here on the Facebook chat. So I'm going to fire these at Austin, put them on the spot, see what we can do. Um, let's see. Give Eddie full permission to dive in and correct me if I, say, if I have said anything wrong or if I'm about to. Um, yeah. I am just a planetary. You have a bonus planetary scientist in the uh, in the uh, team tonight, so that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. First question: um, Is our orbital speed that much faster than Mars, or is it the orbital, or is it the smaller orbit? So I think this is when you are running the orbits, looking at the relative motions of the planets. You want to give that one a go? Yeah, I mean a uh, little bit of both, right? I think uh, I can't remember Mars's speed exactly. I always try to remember Earth's speed, and then I forget all the other ones. I think Earth is going around like 20,000 kilometers per hour, something like that, maybe more. Um, and I can't remember Mars's speed, but the important thing, it's slower, of course, but the important thing is that, you know, distance between them. So it is, even if Mars was faster, Mars would just speed up and come closer to Earth's orbit. So Mars's speed is kind of where it's at. And that's why astronomers, we like to think of things in terms of just how long it takes to go around. So Earth takes one year, Mars takes um, a little around two and uh, or less than two. And then the catch up time for us, which is important to us is 26 months. So that's, you know, there's always that two years and a couple of months offset between these. You start seeing uh, news articles about Mars is gonna be like 5,000 times bigger in the sky. And it's like, I can do that in the planetarium, but that's not gonna happen in the real sky. <laughs> Um, so oh, yeah. yeah, I think what uh, Earth is like 30 kilometers per second speed, which I know is not a unit we ever think about. Uh, but I think comparatively, Mars okay. is only a few kilometers per second slower. I said kilometers per hour, didn't I? Yeah. Well, but your number was much bigger. Uh, so <laughs> right. um, yeah. So so they're actually not that far apart when you think about speeds, but the distance is much greater. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see, next question. Um, why do all the planets orbit the sun in the same direction and largely on the same plane? Um, so this kind of goes back to just the origin of solar systems. Uh, like what, you know, what forms a solar system and you, you kind of go back to what forms a star and then you have this huge giant cloud of gas that if you were to measure the velocity of the gas going around in a circle or in any direction at all, you're not gonna really notice anything. But as that gas cloud collapsed through a lot of complicated mechanisms, it gains angular momentum. And you might've heard this a thousand times, but as a ballerina brings her arms in, she speeds up. And um, that same process is happening as the solar system collapses. It speeds up in that little bit of tiny motion that might've been in the gas cloud. It could have been just any kind of general motion um, sort of collects into the direction of all the gas orbiting a star. And then that gas and dust and little material starts to form bigger pieces of dust and micro asteroids and mini asteroids. That's not a real term, but you know, bigger and bigger stuff until you form planets. And they kind of all got that rotation from the beginning of a solar system. Now I say that, but I'm sure there's probably dozens of exoplanets that we found around other stars that are not doing that at all. Um, but uh, that's just a growing field, and I don't know what that means. So, yeah, just generally, they mostly, they mostly are. Mostly are okay. Yeah, cool. that's good. That's a, that's a nice little comfort in these crazy times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, planetary motions are somewhat certain. Yes, in all of this. <laughs> uh, last question that I think that came in here: uh, Do the rocks on how do the rocks on Mars compare to rocks on Earth in terms of elements, minerals, and formations? Um, not too up on and up on, not yeah, not too familiar with like exact chemistry. Uh, I know the thing I always keep in my head, and grant you know, granted I talk to mostly kids, so I usually keep a simple list of information in my brain. Uh, Mars is red from the uh, iron oxide or a form of a variant of iron oxide in its uh, ground that's exposed to space. There's no atmosphere like we have, and um, I think there's just like a pretty complicated difference, I say complicated, but, you know, rusty dirt, I guess, is the general idea that I 
walk away with. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know. Like inside, does Mars have a completely different composition of its internals? Probably. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about the uh, mineralogy of Mars. No, yeah. <laughs> mostly, it's mostly rock, just like Earth. Yeah. So like really silicates. Silicate okay. rocks and some yeah. carbony rocks. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that every planet formed out of the same initial cloud of material. So the mm -hmm. elemental yeah. composition yeah. should be similar across the solar system. It depends what happened since they formed, I guess. But, and sort of where yeah. they formed. Right. Yes, yeah. some places are much colder and icier than places like Earth. Yeah. And Mars. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, one, one last question came in, which we'll do before we switch over to Addy's talk. Um, what adjustments had to be made to be able to fly something on Mars based on the atmosphere? What is that drone capable of? Does anyone uh, know? Probably a lot of propulsion. Um, you have to keep the package small, I'm sure, and then be able to power it quite beyond what you'd need to power like a drone here on Earth. I, you also see multiple rotors uh, on the Ingenuity rover and it's just got to have a lot of lift to utilize that very thin atmosphere. Um, yeah, but yeah, just there's not not a lot of air to push on to move yourself around. Yeah, yeah, and they probably compensated by just like making it like smaller, uh, lighter. You can't put a lot of experiments on it like you can with Perseverance and Curiosity. Um, yeah. But it's also a test mechanism. So I'm excited to see the future after it, you know, I say after it succeeds, I'm assuming it's going to succeed because NASA and JPL and everybody involved in those science projects kicks butt. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to succeed and who knows how they'll improve on that in the future when they know they can do it, right? They'll pretty push the envelope. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay. I think that is the majority of the questions that came in. If you have any other questions that you think of for um, Austin or any of the rest of us, keep those in mind. Feel free to dump them into the chat at any point. I'll try to keep a running tally of those. What we're going to do now is switch over to our second talk of the evening. I'm going to let uh, Addy take it away. I wasn't prepared. Just kidding. OK, let's see. Share slides. And boom. All right, so hopefully you can see my first slide. I just got a thumbs up, so I'll take that as a good sign. Um, ignore all the words on the first part of the slide, but there are some fun pictures. Um, so hi, everybody. Once again, um, I'm Addie Dove, and I am in the physics department at the University of Central Florida. Um, and I am a planetary scientist, and most of my work is laboratory work. So. I um, appreciate pictures and videos from other planets as we just saw some of them. And I try to do experiments here on the ground to put some of those in context and understand things like the dusty rocks on other planets and how early planetary systems form. Um, so I will talk to you a little bit about some of the context for that. And it's actually, it was a great uh, lead in from Austin. Um, and then some of the ways that I study uh, these things. And you'll see, I think all of these pictures again featured throughout the slides, so keep an eye out. Um, so we just talked about perseverance, um, and I'm going to turn this down a bunch. Uh, but I'm showing a, a different clip here um, from Perseverance Landing. Um, and so I study the dusty rocks <laughs> on these planetary surfaces, and specifically the like really fine dusty bits on them. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but so for me, things like these videos from other planets um, show these really exciting phenomena that are happening as we're going to other planetary bodies. Um, and it's hard to cover up the excitement here, so I'm going to pause it. <laughs> um, but the, the really cool thing to me is looking at sort of the structures and the way the dust moves on uh, these planets and, and how the, the dust moves and forms and what the rocks are that are underneath and how they move around. Um, that's sort of the most recent video we have of landing on another planet, but there have actually been some really cool missions recently that have um, also touched down on other planetary surfaces, um, including asteroids. So we just talked a bunch about Mars. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about asteroids and the moon here as well. Um, and all these planets are uh, 
and planetary bodies, I'll call them planets, don't get offended, please, uh, are um, surfaces that have really interesting structures. They have lots of rocks um, and lots of dust. And two of the uh, asteroids we've gone to recently are called Bennu and Ryugu. Um, so Bennu has been the target of the NASA OSIRIS-REx mission. Um, they recently uh, touched down on the surface and they're doing another uh, mission coming up here soon uh, to fly back by it again. And then Ryugu is a, an asteroid that's slightly larger that the um, Hayabusa 2, the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission, uh, went to and explored. And these two asteroids um, are sort of similar in shape. Um, they're very, very, very small. So you can see at the tops there, it says the, the diameters. So half a kilometer and a kilometer, right? Uh, Devin could run around these super fast. Um, so we have recently gone to these uh, planets, these planetary bodies, and um, sent uh, spacecraft missions there. Um, and uh, they touched down on the surface actually. So they didn't land. It's really, really, really hard to land on these surfaces, but they did touch down briefly and then back away. Um, so this is a, these are a couple of photos of um, Ryugu and this one on the right I love because it shows um, one of the interesting sites they were exploring, but also it has this really cool shadow of the spacecraft. So the, the shadow down there sort of on the right, the sun is behind the spacecraft and it's sort of backlighting it. And you can see the shadow of um, Hayabusa 2 on the surface. And I just love sort of these, you see the selfie cams from things like uh, the, the Mars rovers, but there's these really cool pictures we get from other planetary surfaces as well. Um, and then Hayabusa 2 actually sent some little landers, some little basically CubeSat, tiny spacecraft, but is things down to the surface that plopped down and took a few pictures. Um, so one of the ones on the right is one of those pictures. And then the left is that zoomed in area that was shown in the previous region where you see these crazy structures and rocks and stuff like that here on the surface of Ryugu. Um, similarly, OSIRIS-REx went to Bennu and you can see another rocky <laughs> gray surface. Um, they're, these aren't uh, black and white photos, by the way. These are pretty much real color. Um, they're very exciting rocks. They just are also gray. If you care about chemistry and study chemistry, though, they're very exciting to you. I don't study chemistry, so. Um, so both uh, Hayabusa 2 and uh, OSIRIS-REx touched down on the surfaces of these planets. And this is the first touchdown of Hayabusa 2 um, on Ryugu. So you can see this is from 20, uh, February 22, 2019. Um, that up in the sort of the center of the image, you can see a little sampling mechanism they had. So these touchdowns actually collected a sample and then bring it back up with it. And these samples from Ryugu are actually all the way, ooh, we'll get some fun ads. Um, are actually all the way uh, back here on Earth now. So uh, Hayabusa 2 has done a successful sample return from uh, Ryugu. Um, and so here in this video, you can see, we're gonna play it back uh, to here. You can see it slowly approaching and notice this is sped up. Um, it sort of touches the surface. You can see it gets closer and closer to the different types of exciting rocks that it has there. Touches the surface, makes a big mess, and backs away. So this is kind of scary because you're like sending your spacecraft down and it's making a big mess and all there's stuff flying everywhere and you really don't want to damage your spacecraft. Uh, so you then back away and, and sort of go away for a bit and try to study the site. And so this Japanese mission was super ambitious. They did a second touchdown then at a slightly um, different site where they had already shot a little impactor to make a crater. Um, and they went then and touched down on that site to try to get a different type of sample, a different type of rock from slightly more inside uh, the asteroid. So you can see here, this was on July 11th, 2019, um, the uh, sampling mechanism. So these are images of the site before the touchdown. I don't even know what these ads are. Um, so it happens when you have YouTube links. Um, but you can see the, the sampling mechanism. Um, and then we actually have the spacecraft once again, approaching the surface and magic happens and it freezes your video. Uh, let's see right there, hopefully it'll play. Um, there we go, touching down on the surface and now it's backing away again. You can see the really cool spacecraft. Um, 
shadow as it backs away. Um, but once again, as it touches down, it makes this giant mess on the surface. So you think, right, that it's sort of ramming in really fast and then backing away. But actually, these things are moving at like centimeters per second, which is like if you took something and you took a little marble or you took this thing, spacecraft and you sort of dropped it from maybe this height above your hand, it would be moving at sort of the speed that this thing is moving at. So it's a really, really slow controlled descent. It touches the surface, but it still makes this huge mess. And the question is, why is it doing that? And we're just watching the same thing over and over again. Um, so OSIRIS-REx has also done this. We'll watch one more exciting video of black and white rocks going everywhere. Um, the sampling mechanism looks a little bit different here. I'm gonna pause it real quick. Um, but you can see here's the sampling mechanism for OSIRIS-REx. Again, it's on an arm that's sort of reaching out so that most of the spacecraft is further away. Um, we didn't wanna like sort of have something try to touch down and run into another rock with your spacecraft. So we wanted to have the arm be able to reach out and get something on the surface. Um, and this sampler mechanism, once again, then touches down. As you get closer and closer, it does a little maneuver, touches again, actually very gently, although it doesn't look like it, and then backs away. So the question is, as we're landing on these surfaces with Perseverance, for instance, or as we are um, touching down on these asteroids with uh, our spacecraft, why are things going to behave differently than they do here on Earth? How do we understand the surfaces of these bodies? And how do we make predictions for how we're going to do that sampling or how the dust is going to swirl around the spacecraft as we're landing on Mars? Um, and a lot of that has to do with um, understanding the atmospheres of those bodies. So uh, Austin already mentioned that Mars basically has no atmosphere. It has a very, very, very thin atmosphere, um, which is actually more atmosphere than any of the other bodies we look at. So the moon, Phobos and Deimos, which are moons of Mars, and then Bennu and Ryugu, none of those things have an atmosphere. They're all too small, basically, to have an atmosphere. They can't hold on to the gas that just escapes from the body. Um, but the Earth has a nice, still very thin, actually, if you've seen the sort of the, the, the um, images, right? The very thin layer on the top of our surface. Um, but it's a nice atmosphere that causes all of these uh, weather effects and things like that. But these other bodies don't have an atmosphere. So um, they're just exposed to space. And a lot of the interactions we have are basically what's called in vacuum, right? They're in the vacuum of space. The other big difference though, is the size of these bodies. So here you can see the size comparison of the earth and Mars much smaller. Um, the moon, even smaller still, and then Bennu and Ryugu, you can't see on here because they're teeny, teeny, tiny, right? Um, and the difference that makes is, is in terms of the gravity on these planets. Um, so the Earth, we say, has one G, one Earth gravity. Um, the moon has about a sixth of an Earth gravity, and Mars has about a third of an Earth gravity. Um, and that's mostly based on the size of the body. So somebody asked earlier, uh, what is Mars made of and what are the rocks made of? Uh, mostly these bodies are sort of rocky things. They maybe have a little bit of metals in them. Um, but those, so the size and the density of these things are rocky. And so that's what's going to determine the um, gravity on the surface. Um, things like Bennu and Ryugu are so, so, so small that they basically don't have gravity on the surface. We call it microgravity. So almost none. Um, and so it's really challenging to understand how things are going to behave in microgravity. It's very non-intuitive. We're so used to everything happening here on Earth. Like if I uh, pick up something, right, and drop it, let go of it, it'll fall to the ground. Um, on the moon, that'll happen, but sort of slower. On Mars, it'll happen sort of in between those speeds. But on an asteroid, it might just stay where it is. Um, if you give it a little bit of a flick, it will probably fly off into space. So you can think about what we just saw with um, Hayabusa and with OSIRIS-REx and those touching the surfaces actually really slowly, but causing this giant mess. And that's because there's so little gravity. So um, that's what I try to understand is how things behave in microgravity um, and how we can characterize it. Um, oh yeah, I put this slide in because I always have to have this slide in a talk, which is to define the word regolith. So I've been using terms like dust and rock Technically, all of the material on these planetary surfaces is called regolith, uh, which is just a fancy word for broken up bits of rock. 
um, but it sounds really uh, fancy if you say it. So you can use that in your uh, party at the next party you go to in two years. Um, and uh, so this is just made up of all the stuff that's on the surface, these rocks that are on the surface that are usually sort of broken up over time and form finer and finer materials. So on the moon, there's a lot of really fine stuff. It's just like it's been pulverized over time. We just saw on the asteroids though, that some of the rocks are a lot bigger. Um, and that's probably due to the fact that all the really fine stuff either sort of settles inside or gets kicked off during impacts and things like that because there's so little gravity to hold on to it. Um, one caveat also is that dust is not the same dust uh, that you have here, uh, definitely not on your surfaces or your computer screens or anything like that. Um, most of the dust here on Earth is gross organic stuff and human things and bug things. Um, all the dust on these planetary surfaces is just rocks, fancy rocks. Um, so how do I study all of these things? So um, I study these things by finding different ways to put things in microgravity, to put things in simulated weightlessness, basically. So if you think of weightlessness, you think of things like the astronauts orbiting the Earth. They're basically falling around the Earth all the time in a controlled manner, and that's what gives them weightlessness. Um, if you've ever been in an elevator where the cables are cut, hopefully you never have, but that's also weightlessness. Um, but maybe more something like a Tower of Terror or one of those amusement park things where they lift you up and then drops you suddenly. Your stomach sort of floats up, you sort of float off your seat for a second. That also is a very, very brief moment of weightlessness. Um, and we actually have something like that in our lab here at UCF. Um, there's a very fancy picture where you can see we have lots of foam to slow things down. Um, and we can drop things from the ceiling and get about a little less than a second of microgravity or of weightlessness in which we can do some actually really cool experiments. So we use a high speed camera and in that amount of time you can actually do things like little impacts or little touchdown events like we just saw on Hayabusa and Osiris with Hayabusa and Osiris Rex and we can understand actually how these uh, things occur. Um, some of these things are plumes and jets like what we already looked at. Uh, there's an example here uh, we already looked at the Perseverance landing. There's a similar one um, in this video from a Chinese lunar lander from um, a couple years ago. Here it's sort of approaching the surface. This is very sped up. And as it lands, you can sort of see it does a little maneuver. And then you again see these sort of plumes of material as it's moving away from the surface, uh, moving away from the lander. Um, so we've done some experiments like this in our drop tower. So on the left, you can see in 1G, again, just sort of sitting on the bench. And then on the right is when we, when we have it in our drop tower. And so these are the exact same conditions. So we have these little centimeter sized rocks for scale. And on the right, you can definitely see that something's happening, right? You see some of the fine stuff blow up, um, but you don't see any of the other rocks move. And that's because gravity is holding them down. But if you do the same thing in microgravity in our drop tower, it makes the, some of the bigger chunks fly up. Um, and this is just with a really, really tiny, like 10 millisecond burst of air. Um, we can do a similar thing with a slightly longer burst of air. Um, in that case, again, this is the exact same uh, experiment on the left. You see, okay, maybe some of the slightly bigger particles fly up, but none of the big ones move. But on the right, we make a giant mess. Um, and they're settling at the end because it hits the ground. Um, <laughs> so it's these, it's something that's really not in, unintuitive from how we're thinking about things, right? If you drop a thing on the ground from up high, it's going to make a mess. If you drop it from low, nothing's going to happen. But it's completely different on these planetary bodies that don't have much gravity. Um, we also then, uh, get to do experiments on things like parabolic flights. So maybe you've heard of the vomit comet um, or other things like that. So these are airplane flights that do parabolas. So they basically go up and then they tip over and sort of fall in a controlled manner again. Um, and that gives us this uh, about 30 seconds of microgravity. So I'll play this again. Um, this is me and some of my students and then a lot of other people on the plane uh, doing some experiments in microgravity. So you can see we're laying down at the beginning. Uh, that's because in between the weightlessness, you have like two Gs because the plane has to pull back up. And so you actually feel about two Gs, twice Earth gravity on you. So you lay down just so it pushes on your chest, doesn't push all the blood out of your head. Um, and you don't pass out, for instance. Um, 
And then, uh, but so we can do some really interesting experiments in about 30 seconds by using these parabolic flights. I'll have another video from that in a second. Some of those experiments are very exciting shooting a marble into dirt experiments. Um, very scientific marbles and dirt though. Um, it's very, it's regolith, for instance, we use simulated regolith. So this is an example of having some asteroid gravity, so 0 0.5 Gs. And when we shot a marble at a certain speed into uh, some sand and it made what you can see a nice little ejecta plume. And this was at some moderate gravity, but you can still see the effects of gravity because everything falls back down. Um, if we do some of the same experiments in very low gravity. So you can see the box is moving here. It's actually the plane that's moving, but we won't talk about that right now. But um, so you can see the box is floating on the plane in this case. Uh, and you, we have a little impact into a much more solid surface. It bounces up a little bit, but you can also see some stuff that gets ejected and it just keeps going because again, it's in this microgravity free floating environment. Um, I'll play it one more time. You can see that ejecta there, some extra clumps that got stuck to things. Um, and just for context, it's a box that's about this size and it's going to be floating in the cabin of the airplane. Uh, and you sort of release it and then make sure you bring it back to the ground before uh, you come out of your parabola because you don't want it landing on you, for instance. It would be very heavy and painful. Um, another way we can do microgravity experiments uh, is with suborbital flights. So this is actually really new. It's mostly in the last five-ish years. Um, but these are flights from companies like Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic that are making very short, about five-minute flights um, that just does, sort of goes up into space and comes back down. Um, and this gives us about three minutes of microgravity to do even longer versions of similar experiments. Um, and there's a lot of words on that slide. This is an example of an experiment that we used, uh, that we did on a Blue Origin flight, it had some tubes of regolith, tubes of dirt in them. You can kind of see that nice, sweet gray dirt down here. Um, there's some colored uh, shards of glass that we use as sort of a, a calibration. Um, and then this is Citronaut Dave, our micro G indicator and our mascot. Uh, he actually got to go to space and I'm super jealous of him. Um, and he has uh, spent about three minutes in space so far. He's hopefully flying again this year. Um, but one of the things we can do is some different experiments, and you can just see a little video here, um, which doesn't show you much, it's exciting to me, but it doesn't look that exciting to everyone else, you're like, oh, there's not much moving, but Dave is sort of, oops, sorry, Dave is floating over here, you can see him sort of floating up in the air, and there's some rocks over here that move a little bit, but not too much, and that's really exciting, I promise. Um, but here's a quick uh, video or some still shots of Dave as our micro G indicator or our, our gravity indicator. Uh, he was floating, sort of you could see at that video. Then as the capsule starts to come back down, he starts to experience more gravity. So you can see him sort of settling down. And then he had lots of gravity and he gets really tired and sort of uh, gets smooshed down. And then he gets back into 1G and looks kind of like that. So it was a fun, we actually had a, an accurate accelerometer on this experiment, but this is a more fun way to look at it. So he gets all smooshed though, and it's sad. Um, Dave has also flown on parabolic flights. So I'll leave this as um, I think my last, my second to last slide, but uh, this is another example from a context camera of one of our parabolic flights. Um, sorry, my hair gets in the way here. Um, but you've noticed I actually did push a button to start an experiment. We weren't just having fun on this. Um, and uh, that's one of my students, Tyler. He's an undergraduate here at UCF. Um, he was experiencing, this was his first microgravity flight, so he was uh, still getting his flight legs. Uh, but you see, it's, it's sort of weird to move around and you're sort of flying all over the place. They yell at you if you start swimming. Um, but these flights are research flights, so they're just people doing research aboard. Um, so they're very different from like the tourist flights where you see people supermanning through the plane. We don't ever get to do that because there's like, giant racks and hardware in the way. Um, but uh, so those are some examples of how we do some of these experiments, why we care about them, um, and why you should care about gravity and dirt or regolith. So here's just some pictures um, here at the end, and I'm happy to take any questions. And also check out my podcast, Walk About the Galaxy. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Addy. Everyone watching the live stream, make sure you click the little emoji button, make those little things pop up in their cool digital <laughs> way. Um, 
So cool. And also uh, bookmark that walk about the galaxy, take a look, find your, whatever your favorite podcast listening device is, look that up. Um, thanks, Eddie. So I think we're going to move to questions. Before we dive into questions, I had one uh, in one of your videos in the background. Uh -huh. There's a guy who, as far as I can tell, when you go into weightlessness, he just floats there for a bit and then falls. Was he doing an experiment? He's just in the background behind you and he's got a weird gadget on his head. And it seems oh, like he yeah. falls up and back down again. Yeah, so one of the really fun things about those flights is that there's people doing all sorts of science on them. So a lot of people do study human factors and like how things, how humans behave in, in low gravity. Um, and sometimes we've had people who are like pilots testing different devices that are testing like eye reaction times and things like that. So I don't remember exactly what those uh, guys were doing, but there are some people who've tested like touch gloves and, and eye reaction things. Um, so they were probably actually doing something for science, but sometimes it's hard to tell. Yeah, it's just sometimes you have like an extra team member who just loaded, things out. Loaded, plopped down. That was a <laughs> yeah. distance on that flight. Yeah. And you can cool. see the coach, the woman in the background, she was standing the whole time. So if you fly a lot, you get really used to it and you can just stand through the whole flight. Wow, ah, neat. Okay. Uh, so let's see, questions that came in during the, uh, the talk there. Um, one of the first questions that came up was, how do samples taken from high of Hayabusa, Busa, get back to Earth? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, Austin, men Austin mentioned in his talk that uh, the Mars samplers were sort of caching it, so they're leaving it on the Mars surface to pick something else to go and pick it up. Um, and these, in the case of Hayabusa and Osiris-Rex, those missions were actually designed to be sample return missions. So they go to the surface, they had their sample canisters, they sort of scooped up um, some material, they put it in a nice, nice safe canister, um, that then was in its own little return capsule. And uh, Hayabusa 2 then came back by, after it went to the asteroid, came back by the Earth, dropped off the capsule so that it would return uh, to the surface. And it landed in the Woomera Desert in Australia, uh, where the team went and picked it up. Uh, and then OSIRIS-REx is actually gonna be returning its sample in a couple of years. Um, and it will land in, I think, Utah. Cool. So they have nice. little sample return capsules that protect protect them. The precious cargo. Um, there's a follow up to that that came in a little bit later, but I think we'll jump to that because it's I feel like related. Um, do scientists try to find micro microbes in any of the regolith recovered uh, in the off chance there's weird life forms that could exist, or would it become contaminated once it arrives on Earth and thus negate anything we could find? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So we on places like the Moon and asteroids where they're Pretty, there's no water, there's, they're airless, right? They don't have an atmosphere. We don't expect to see things like microbes necessarily. There could be things that are things like amino acids and other organics um, that we definitely expect to see on asteroids. Um, and so generally when we bring these samples back, they're kept in very controlled environments. So a lot of times the containers are filled with nitrogen um, and then they're brought to special receiving facilities that keep them basically uh, out of Earth's atmosphere and out of Earth contamination so they don't get contaminated. And if you ever see pictures of people touching those samples, they're gonna be in like the bunny suits and super clean conditions. So we try to keep those samples as uncontaminated as possible, not only for understanding organics and things like microbes, um, but also to just keep those samples pristine so we can figure out the chemistry and the rock type and things like that. Cool. They're going to get messed up by our atmosphere. Right. Okay, let's see. I think you answered this one earlier. So hopefully this one's a straightforward one. Uh, there was a question that came in that I think was before you talked about it, but what's the surface gravity of one of these objects relative to Earth gravity? How small is it? How much would you weigh there? And I think you talked about that. Uh, yeah, so on on the moon, it's like one sixth of the Earth. Um, and so actually on those parabolic flights, sometimes they do, they usually do a few lunar parabolas, a few Martian parabolas, and I hate Mars gravity, just for reference, it's awkward and weird. So it's one third of the Earth's gravity. So it's like enough that you still feel it, but it's like not weightlessness. And so it's really obnoxious, but lunar gravity is pretty fun. Um, these tiny little asteroids um, basically don't have gravity. So we call it microgravity or millage um, because they're so small that they really don't have a gravitational, you don't feel a gravitational force on the surface. Some of the bigger asteroids are gonna have something like, like I said, 0.05 G kind of thing. So really small. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it hard to land there. In addition is like, you can't really 
land on a surface that doesn't have like a landing surface gravity to, to land on, you would very easily bounce back off. Um, so it's an interesting challenge, but you're basically weightlessness though. So. Nice. Um, and then I think, uh, let's see, one or two more. Uh, one of the questions came up, how do you actually get time on the Vonda Comet doing these science experiments? Uh, so uh, all of our missions are on these research flights. And so we propose to NASA um, and NASA has specific programs where you can get funding to do research on parabolic flights and suborbital flights um, through what's called the Flight Opportunities Program. Um, and so you have to present either like a science or a technology development case. Um, other people work with companies and some of those companies fund the flights. Um, if you're interested in just going as a tourist, you can pay some amount of money that's maybe around $5,000 to fly. Uh, on on one of them, <laughs> um, rich and so life, yeah. Well, you can also go on suborbital flights sometime in the near future for maybe only like two hundred and fifty k. So uh, there's those chances too. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I'm just going to assume that you're going to sneak me onto one at some point in the future, and if you yes, don't, of course, I will hold it against you. Do you smush like Citrona Dave? Uh, I can be as small as him if necessary. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Um, perfect. Great. Uh, the last question that came in. Um, how does moon dust form slash accumulate? Where is it coming from? From space or weathering of in-place rock? Where is that coming from? Mm. Um, so yes, is the answer to that question. So mostly it's the rock that's already there on the surface. Um, so the moon formed, it was a big rock. Uh, but over time, it's been hit by lots of other rocks, micrometeorites, meteorites, things like that, that smash into the surface and break up the rocks. Um, so you see some really big boulders still, but a lot of that really fine material, especially on the moon surface. Um, when you have an impact, sometimes if it's fast, all of that stuff sort of evaporates and becomes part of the material there. Sometimes if it's slower, you have chunks that get left. Um, so mostly the moon is made out of original moon material, but there are things like meteorites uh, uh, on the lunar surface. There could be things like Mars meteorites on the, on the moon surface. So. Cool. Thanks. Well, I think that's all the questions we had for your talk. So we'll thank Patty again for doing a fantastic job showing us those sweet videos and promising to put me on a suborbital flight at some point. Um, or parabolic, sure. I guess suborbital might be harder. That looked very small. It's a, it's uh, a little harder, but yeah. they're only like 15 minutes late. So. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'll look forward to that. What we're going to do now is we're going to take our break. We're going to do a bit of an intermission before we jump into uh, Chelsea's tapped in segment, which we'll do after the break. During the break, you're going to have the opportunity. I'm going to actually put up a set of rotating slides. Those of you that are that are here, this is your opportunity to refill your beverage, step away, uh, you know, breathe for a minute, just sort of bask in all of the science that you've uh, enjoyed this evening. Um, and then we'll come back. We'll normally take about 10 minute break. So we'll be back at about 820 or so, uh, maybe a little bit, a couple minutes after that. But we will come back. Um, and then after Chelsea's segment, we'll actually open the floor to any general uh, astronomy questions that may come. So if you have questions about the news segment, questions about astronomy in general, things you've heard in the news that are not covered, we'll do our best as a little group here to answer those questions. So I'm going to set up the slideshow and then we'll be back in, well, now about uh, tw uh, 10 minutes still. So on my clock, I have no idea what time it is in the virtual streaming world, uh, but about 8.22. All right, let me get things set up.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully you had an opportunity to answer the trivia questions to the best of your ability and enter the raffle. Uh, I forgot to mention that we will be raffling off, as we did last month, um, some gift cards to local Lansing businesses. Um, I believe we've tried to pick uh, places um, where you can, even if you're not local to the Lansing area, you can order something and potentially get it shipped out to you. So even if you're not a Lansing local, the prize can still mean something. You might just get something from a place you know nothing about. So uh, be prepared for that. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll get some good things going there. Um, and what we're going to do now is transition on to our astronomy news segment segment by the illustrious Dr. Chelsea Harris. Um, and before we do that, I'm going to do a quick change of wardrobe. There we go. All right. Perfect. Uh, feeling much better now. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and let Chelsea take over from here. Okay. Share screen. Step one. Fine. Oh, I'm going to interrupt. Remember, as you have questions that come up, please put them into the chat so we can answer them. Sorry, Chelsea. Take away. That's okay. This thing is blocking my... There we go. Okay. Astronomy on tap news segment that I finally developed the name for tapped in. So let's get tapped in. Since we last met, what astronomy developments have happened? Well, okay, I'm counting this as astronomy. This is a little bit of me taking the liberty of geeking out about computers. But uh, yeah, so uh, the Antikythera uh, mechanism, don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's this ancient Greek computer. The actual thing we have is shown on the left. It's all corroded and gross. And people, since it was discovered, have been trying to figure out what it was, what its function was, how did it work? Because it seems like from the inscriptions that they were able to predict like the motions of the planets in the sky and eclipses and things like into the future. So it was this analog computer, but it's super like advanced. All its gears and things are way smaller and way more precise than it seems like they would have had the tools to be doing at that time, whatever big mystery like how it was developed in the first place but also like how did it work so this is something people have been working on for a long time there was this um study out of the university of college of london that just came out where they did a digital model where they think that they have all the gears and everything that would actually predict um the motions of the planets and the moon and stuff like that uh accurately so their like recreation is on the right and i personally appreciate that they did all these cool textures and stuff on their model and it looks dope so uh go check that out if you like analog computers and ancient uh computing stuff because ancient people were way better at science than we ever give them credit for i feel like uh the other thing that uh this goes into addy's talk a little bit there was a paper out that uh, says that they found this uh, evidence that organic matter can be produced in situ on the surface of asteroids. Um, and now I forget what this asteroid name was. I meant to write it down on the slide. Uh, but uh, they did one of these things that Addie was talking about where they went and gathered the asteroid sample like in space and then did the super clean uh, sending it back to Earth and everything. And so they were able to find these um, organic uh, signatures and signatures of like water and everything on this asteroid um, from like one piece of dust or whatever. And so um, I now feel a lot better about not dusting my house as often as I feel like I should because apparently that has high science uh, throughput. So uh, that was a really cool study. You should check that out. Um, definitely lending credence to the idea that, you know, life can have these uh, extraterrestrial origins and all that kind of stuff. So very cool. Also pretty cool. Um, so this is out of the, there's this uh, telescope in Tibet looking for um, like super high energy cosmic rays and, and gamma rays. And they reported that they have detected a diffuse ultra high energy cosmic ray background. So it's like 10 to 100 times the energies that, you know, they have like at CERN. These are higher energies than we're able to accelerate particles to on Earth. 
but this just happens like in our galaxy. And we knew that from like supernova remnants and stuff, but what they're showing is that there's actually this diffuse background that's not connected to what we know of as a particle acceleration source. Um, and this would be from either accelerators that are dead, um, well, and regardless that the you, you create the cosmic rays, the gamma rays, and then they interact with the interstellar medium and you know you get these uh, like daughter particles and then we're detecting the daughter particles and in the end you get a diffuse background and so they were reporting the first detection of that so all these little yellow dots are the places where they detected these uh, PEV uh, gamma rays from and the gray shaded out regions like they couldn't see so you can see it's diffuse within the ranges that they can see so very cool result we all thought that this should be there, but to actually detect it is always really exciting because otherwise it's just people making stuff up. Another really cool thing from the Event Horizon Telescope is uh, this middle result. So this middle result is showing you the polarization field around the supermassive black hole that's in the middle of M87. So M87 is a really famous active galaxy. So in the upper left, you can see a like iconic image of it with its radio jet. And basically you just have this black hole, supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy that's actively accreting matter. And big question is like, how are they doing that? Like how does the matter actually get fed into the black hole? And what this study suggests is that uh, there's actually like the magnetic field of the black hole in addition to just the magnetic field that'll be in this disk, as we were saying earlier about conservation of angular momentum, that ends up affecting magnetic fields and everything. So there should be a magnetic field component, um, but then they're also detecting this excess thing that stops the disk from spinning so that it can just like feed in to the black hole and uh, grow its mass. So that was a really exciting result. And uh, that's also, I think, open source right now in AppJ Letters. Things for you to look out for in the coming months until I see you again. Well, the Inspiration4 mission, this is out of SpaceX, so this is a private uh, space thing. It's going to be the first all-civilian crew to orbit the Earth. And they finally announced the last two members who had won some, like, competitions about, like, who's the best at making money, who's the best at raising money, blah, blah, blah. Um, so now they have these four people who represent, like, four core ideals of the mission, Private, private uh, space travel is uh, pretty wild, um, but that's pretty cool. So these four civilians are going to go out to space by the end of the year is the target. So keep an eye out for news about these people. The Ingenuity helicopter that Austin already talked a little bit about is going to make its first flight uh, next Monday at the super convenient time of 3.30 a.m. Eastern because uh, they know we're all rave kids and so we're obviously going to be up at that time. Um, and this is the first like flight of this kind in the Martian atmosphere, which is super thin. So they have these like carbon fiber uh, helicopter wings that they're going to spin really fast and hopefully get it off the ground. I personally don't understand why, but I'm an extra galactic uh, astronomer. So whatever, who, who knows what that means. Um, so you can watch that live and uh, something cool piece of trivia is that they actually have a little piece of um, like a wing from the brothers first flight on this. Uh, so it'll, it should be pretty fun to like actually watch this footage and I'm pretty excited to watch it live for sure, for sure. And then finally, if you are someone who has a telescope, likes telescope stuff and astrophotography, you should definitely watch out for the fact that Jupiter's moons are going to be visibly eclipsing each other from Earth uh, like coming up. So I think April 12th is the next major one. This image is just showing you an example of time series of what you would see through your telescope um, for this. So you can see the moons eclipsing Jupiter and eclipsing each other and eclipsing like background things. And so uh, if you want to try to look out for that, go go to Sky and Telescope, uh, their website, and they have like all the details for, for getting those images. And that is it. Now you are tapped in. And uh, if there's anything that we didn't cover, uh, you can just 
ask about it in the comments and we will give you our hot takes uh reaction videos or whatever to to the news and you can always you know recommend things to us uh to cover next time awesome big thank you to chelsea for tapping us in uh now that we're tapped in feeling super knowledgeable we're going to open the floor to uh, questions that folks may have. There's at least one question that come through. If you have additional questions while we're starting to answer those, please jump those in too. You can also start to filter in uh, any other general astronomy questions that came up. And I really do want to emphasize um, Chelsea's point. If there's things that you hear about in the news that you want us to unpack and address here at Astronomy on Tap, uh, please send us a message via Facebook, uh, tag us, etc. And we'll do our best to get to the bottom of it and do some really high quality uh, alcohol supported investigation. So um, we're ready to do that. I'm happy to find extra reasons to drink, uh, even if it means logging on at 3 a.m. Uh, to watch a tiny, tiny helicopter on Mars try to fly around. So um, I may or may not be there. Uh, we'll see. Uh, don't, uh, don't tag me in anything related to that. Um, all right. So first question that came up, uh, let's see. Are there regulations or concerns regarding private space travel? I'm assuming private companies have to let official groups like NASA know about things like launch dates. Does anyone have a sense for how that works? I am completely unknowledgeable in this area. Yeah, so all launches and any, any just like any airplane flight, all launches are regulated by the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration in the US. And there are other international organizations that monitor international launches. Um, this private flight is being launched by SpaceX from a NASA facility, so from the Cape, um, Cape Canaveral. Um, and so currently everything is still organized through governmental agencies. Um, there's a lot of interesting policy debates happening right now and law debates happening right now about the use of space for private or exploration of the moon and asteroids and things like that as well in terms of like how that how the policy and law apply to those things. So it's a, definitely an interesting um, interesting time to be figuring all that stuff out. Yes, it's gonna be interesting to see, uh, sorry, I was trying to keep up with the chat. Try, interesting to see how this evolves as more and more companies sort of try to carve their little piece out of the giant cosmos that we have above us. Um, and I do think it is interesting that uh, one of the core values of this private mission seems to be money, as far as I can <laughs> tell. Um, so uh, I imagine that might continue to be the case as we privatize space. Uh, but make sure you pay your taxes and keep NASA alive so they don't get edged out of the game. Um, I will say, most of, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if this is what you were about to say, but a lot of the money things, so like the generosity component, they're raising a lot of money for charity. Uh, I think it's St. Jude's, whatever. So it's not, I mean, you know, there's like a lot of corporate greed in there just as a rational American, but, but at least there's like this veneer that we can get behind. Yeah, and I, and, and, go ahead. Eddie, and most sorry. of the people who are selected for the mission aren't like independently wealthy, so. Right. Interesting. Um, uh, I do think that there are good opportunities. I think, uh, you know, given that, given the size of the science budget uh, that we have in our country compared to say, I don't know, defense budget, um, it, it's often hard to do some of these things. So I think partnering with private companies is a good avenue. Um, people who are committed to getting us into space, uh, as long as hopefully they've got the right incentives at heart. Uh, we had a couple questions come in while we were chit-chatting about uh, corporate greed. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, how many sample and return missions have there been so far? What have we learned and why haven't they been in the news? Maybe they have and maybe they're just not making as big a splash. I think that that's, that's probably the case. I think Addy probably knows the answer to this. Uh, I, I, I think that it's like three or something like that too. Uh, so yeah, so there have been three sort of more deep space missions. I'm going to say three asterisks because I feel like I'm forgetting one, um, more deep space missions that have returned samples. So there's been a couple that returned sort of like 
particles that are in between planets, so like solar wind particles and interplanetary dust, um, a couple of those missions. And then the Iakawa uh, asteroid was the Hayabusa 1 mission, and that returned a sample. And it was like a few grams. It wasn't a very successful, but they brought something back, and it was a few grams. The other like big sample return missions were the Apollo missions. Um, but other than that, there haven't been a lot of big sample return. They Oh, the other recent one was from the moon, and it was a Chinese mission, and it just happened a few months ago. They just it was like a five day mission. They launched, landed, sampled, came back. It was insane. Wasn't there one? Oh, this would have been a while ago now. I think I might have been an undergrad, which let's not unpack that. But um, five years ago. <laughs> yeah, just the other day. Um, I believe a, the Stardust mission technically collected comet tail material, which was like. Yeah. Bitty, 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 right? yeah. Yeah. I was sort of lumping that with the interplanetary stuff. But yeah, that one was a, a comet mission. That, yeah, that one, that one I remember because uh yeah, one of my astroastronomy professors in undergrad was involved in that mission. So we all that was one hear, of the... hear about it at length. <laughs> that was one of the mission first things that had a really cool science at home component. They had this whole online interface where you could help them go through the layers of the images they had of the little dust particles in the aerogel. Um, it's called Stardust at Home. It was one of the like first um, citizen science type experiments. Cool. Nice. Um, let's see. Other questions that came in. Uh, uh, question for Addie, what is the size distribution of rocks on the moon? Is it all just sand stuff or do you find big boulders as well? How big do boulders get? So the biggest boulder on the moon is the moon, um, to, which is a sarcastic answer. But so the moon itself is a giant rock, um, which is actually being sarcastic. But like the things we saw, like Bennu and um, Ryugu, are probably not solid things at all. They're what are called rubble piles. That's just like chunks of stuff sort of barely held together um, through some mutual gravitational interactions. But it's not a solid body. Um, but the moon is a solid body. Um, and the then the distribution that you get on the surface is what's called a power law distribution. So anytime you smash things into other things, they break up in a sort of characteristic way where you have um, a few big things and lots of small stuff. So you can reproduce this at home by smashing a rock with a sledgehammer. Um, we used to do this in a lab at Colorado <laughs> for our undergraduates. Um, and uh, so you can produce this where if you sort of smash a rock, you'll get some big stuff uh, and lots of small stuff. And it's what's called a power law where you have few big things uh, lots of small things and sort of a distribution in between. Yes, that was that was the most exciting day. I think that's the only thing that my astronomy lab students ever remember. They got to hit, <laughs> hit rocks with sledgehammers because science. Because science, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see, other questions came in. Um, I don't know really the answer to this one. Uh, are there any initiatives to start cleaning up all of the space junk, especially as more and more private flights are coming up? Does anyone know if anyone has plans to tidy up the immediate vicinity of space? Is that not what gravity is just doing? <laughs> you know, the orbits decay and then it just like burns up. Don't you have to like just leave it, set it and forget it? Like orders? <laughs> yeah, we'll just let it, let it eventually fall into the earth. Yeah, so so that's partially true. There was actually a really cool video recently from a SpaceX launch or a SpaceX booster that um, SpaceX famously relands their first stages of their boosters, but the second stage goes into orbit and then they have to sort of deorbit burn it so it burns up in space, right? They have to put it on the correct orbit so that it burns up, but they missed doing that correctly recently. And one of them re-entered in a more dramatic fashion. And there was some cool videos from Seattle um, from people who saw it. Um, nothing hit the earth, it was fine. Um, but for the most part, yeah, so spacecraft generally deorbit and sort of burn up in the atmosphere over a certain lifetime. So I built a CubeSat, for instance, a little tiny spacecraft about this big. And we had to say, based on its orbit, that it would probably deorbit in like five to 10 years kind of thing. Um, but there is a lot of crap up there. And as, if there's any sorts of little collisions, which there's been some more recently, um, it produces a lot more, again, a power law distribution of a lot of really tiny stuff. And it's tiny stuff, but it's moving at 17,500 miles per hour or whatever, right, as it's orbiting the Earth. So it can actually cause a lot of really intense damage. If you've seen a, the movie Gravity, that's the one, right? Uh, with yeah, Sandra with, uh, Bullock. Uh, 
Yes, Bullock and whoever else was in that. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah. Was, I think maybe Clooney. Yeah. Clooney, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so that is over dramatization, but as an example of what happens if you have lots of <laughs> shocking, lots of debris that hits. Um, and so there are some companies interested in creating like big nets basically um, that are either physical nets or like electromagnetic nets to capture some of this debris and try to corral it. Um, but for the most part, things in orbit are still really far apart. Um, so there's not as much risk of that, but it's getting more and more crowded. So there are people interested. Nice. Oh, and y'all missed it because you can't see our Zoom chat here. Chelsea just made a great pun, magnets for the electromagnetic net. Evan, that's not how I said it in my heart. <laughs> that's how I read it in my words. Um, oh, okay. okay. All right. Uh, let's see, things are de-escalating or de-evolving. I don't know, there's a word. Uh, okay, another question for Addie about moon dust. Uh, I understand the moon dust is very coarse and scratchy due to the lack of weathering on the surface of the moon. Would dust on, how would dust on Mars compare to dust on the moon or some type of material on Earth? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Yes, moon dust danger. Um, uh, Mars dust, a little less danger. Um, so Austin talked a little bit about how a lot of Mars dust is sort of the, the reddish color because it's basically rusted. Um, and that's because it has interactions with the tiny, tiny atmosphere that it has. Um, Mars also has, no longer really has water processes, maybe tiny little ones, but it does have wind. Um, and so like wind and and water are what smooths particles like sand here on Earth. Um, by rolling them around against each other, moving them, they sort of get smoother over time. Um, and so Mars dust will overall be smoother than moon dust. And because it's in an atmosphere, it's already reacted, which is why it's rusty. Um, and so it also doesn't have as much sort of like energy on its surface as sort of bro freshly broken rock might have. All right, I think we have hit all of the questions that have come through. Thank you so much to the audience for engaging. Asking questions always makes it fun for us to have a little bit of a chit chat here at the end. Um, anything else from any of the presenters, lingering comments, thoughts, responses you had before we announce the raffle prize winners? Austin, after Ingenuity flies around, are you gonna have a little graphic for the planetarium where it will like fly around the planetarium? Oh gosh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, that does remind me, I was curious, um, uh, is the software that your planetarium uses, is that a proprietary software or is it some sort of open source package that, how, how are you running that at home or are you currently in the planetarium? Yeah, um, it's it's proprietary. Uh, there were versions in the past that were free. It was developed at the American Museum of National History. Um, they have their own offshoot of this software and they've been building on an open source one called uh, Open Space. That's really kind of cool. Um, you do essentially need a gaming computer to run this stuff. So that's what I'm running this stuff on at home. Um, and then my uh, workstation at the planetarium is uh, essentially like also a gaming computer, like a lot of visual GPU package stuff. And um, yeah, but there are lots of versions. There's open space, which is really fun. It's still growing. It's a pretty big package too. And you need, you do need like a decent computer, but open space also has lots of really cool stuff where you can dive in uh, miles above somewhere on the moon. Like I spent quite a long time uh, one day on my own and I found uh one of the leftover booster rockets from Saturn V. Like I can't remember which, it was like Apollo 16 or something. So there's lots of really amazing like image data that you can get through open space that's not necessarily already available. Um, but yeah, this is one proprietary package. There's a, there's a few big ones. Awesome, that's cool. Um, quite follow up question. Have you ever confirmed that your work computer could in fact be used as a gaming computer? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> of course not, of course not, no, never. Yeah. We, I did briefly hook up a Nintendo Switch to the projector one time, and we, uh, with a friend, this was a couple of years ago, I, we played uh, Breath of the Wild, the new legend, the newer Legend of Zelda game for a little while. It looked terrible because it was like warped, of course, onto a fisheye view, but um, it was possible. <clears throat> it's possible. It's pretty awesome. Wait, now uh, nobody's yeah. going to be able to run that software, though, because nobody can get the graphics cards for those things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's not too bad. The software I'm using is 2015, 14. So <clears throat> you probably run oh. on a, a medium computer. 
Chelsea. Are we allowed to ask questions then? Yes. Question. Yeah, yeah. If you have a question, feel free. Yeah. Okay. So Austin, in your presentation, you were saying like there's the rift on Mars and you were like, oh, it looks similar to like a plate tectonic rift. And then you said something like, I don't think Mars had plate tectonics. And I was like, I need expansion on that because plate tectonics are like so whack and uh, I don't keep up with all this like solar system stuff. Um, <laughs> like really anything in our galaxy is like bleh. Um, so pedantic. It's like, what are we doing? Um, <laughs> So, like, do you have uh, reasons that you don't think Mars had plate tectonics? Um, I think, uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, I think that's still something we're learning because, like, ro uh, not rovers, but landers, like, InSight is one of our, like, one of the, like, the really big efforts to actually look inside Mars using seismography. I think, like, a week ago, they heard, like, a couple of 3.3 magnitude Mars quakes. Um, but I think, I think Mars probably, from what I understand, Mars might resemble the moon in that a lot of those surface features like that might come from um, the planet cooling down. It didn't have enough of a core to actually generate uh, movement in the mantle, I think. Uh, I mean, obviously it did in the past, but it, you know, it had huge volcanoes, but um, those volcanoes aren't doing anything any now. We don't see any new ones necessarily. But um, I think one, thing I always remember is that Mars may have cooled down and shrunk and just cracked open almost. Um, so like instead of like a force beneath pushing the like upper crust apart, it was just the crust was just being pulled apart by itself, um, I think. But I'm not sure if that's actually just set in stone canon for Mars yet because uh, we just don't I don't think we have like a ton of internal Martian geology built up yet from what I understand. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool rift and we get to see it from space. So that's fun. All right, uh, awesome. Anything else before we announce the winners for our raffle prize? All right, trivia guru, Rachel, please. All me. right, all right. So by, by the decree of the random number generator based on all of your responses, um, we've got three gift cards to give away uh, where Astronomy on Tap is uh, this month featuring 517 Barbecue, Sleepwalker, and Strange Matter Coffee. Um, so even if you don't win a gift card, go give, give local businesses your, your money in these times. They're all doing a great job hanging in there. Um, so our first winner is Paul Woodman. Um, so... Congratulations, Paul. Congratulations, Paul. Our second winner um, is no one's allowed to be be mad if in random number number generator, not me, but the winner is Tori Truskowski, who also happens to be my sister in Rhode Island tuning in. Um, <laughs> that was the random number generator's fault, but you know, I, I guess she can have a prize. Uh, and then our final winner is Michelle Rodiers. Ruddy all right. Congratulations so, to all our winners. Uh, uh, as Rachel said, you know, supporting local businesses, whether you want a prize or not, it's always awesome and great to do. Uh, takeout, delivery, uh, whatever you're feeling comfortable with these days, please support the businesses through this, these hard and challenging times. Um, those of you that won, uh, hopefully we have your email address. Uh, I'll be reaching out to you. Um, I always take longer than I claim I will. So if you get impatient, bug me about it on Facebook. You will eventually get your gift card, I promise. Uh, those of you that won last time who may be tuning in right now, I apologize how slow I was. Life is hard and I'll try to be better. All right, uh, so uh, congrats to all of you. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, it's always exciting to do, it's always fun. Uh, I've really been enjoying being back after our hiatus after last year, because 2020 was rough, but 2021 is starting to look up. Although uh, Michigan here, things are a little bit scary from time to time. Uh, given our current uh, coronavirus numbers, but hopefully if everything goes as intended, we'll see you at some point uh, in person in the future. But book, mark your calendars, May 12th, we will be back. I wanna do one last big thank you to uh, our presenters this evening, Addie, Austin, and Chelsea. So give them another emoji. Thank you, boom, boom, whatever on the uh, magical Facebook uh, stream. Um, uh, Citronaut Dave made an appearance who I understand is a Florida thing. Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. 
Um, but uh, orange and an astronaut. Oh, all right, all right. I'm on board. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm taking Citronaut Dave's next seat on the parabolic flight. Uh, he's going to get me hooked up, and uh, we will be back in May on May 12th. So thank you, folks, uh, and we will see you next time.